first, let's talk about Places, the Journey of My Days, My Lives, the first book you wrote, uh, which uh, came out what, last year, year, year before last year, I think. Um, yeah. When did you realize, oh, my gosh, I want to really travel, and this is what I want to do. I want to you know, get more money so I can go to Egypt or I can go to Cuba or I can go to Greece. Or, uh, it, but when did you realize this is what you really love to do, or was it just always something you just knew? Well, no, I, uh, you know, when you're that young, you don't, you don't have enough experience to have any objective, really. I think it's because Australia was so isolated, uh, a country from so many, and to catch a plane to go anywhere, um, so it always looked like it was something at a distance. And then when I got a free trip to America with the Ballet for Glorica of Mexico, that changed things. I started to see. Mexico was the first civilization I saw outside of Australia, and from there I went to America, to New York. So all these, suddenly, uh, I was thrust into these places, and then I had to land, and I landed in New York. But I think the choice of all the other countries, because I did so much study for in history of those cultures, so as, as things went on, and I was accumulating some monies where I could afford to take a journey, um, you know, I didn't go to a country once. I mean, Greece, I went over 20 times. The same with Italy. Egypt, I've been, you know, 12 times, no, 11 times. Uh, Cuba, many times. But Morocco, all the Middle East, Syria. Um, but they're all my education. It wasn't like, you know, I was going on a holiday. Hi, everybody, I'm going on another trip again, and I'm going to be sitting my sunglasses on in some wonderful chauffeur car and just pretending I'm enjoying something. It was really about understanding another culture. It was... That other side of me that didn't become professional in archaeology is the person that started to spring forth. So when I went to Egypt, I was the country where I, from New York, that I went to the first Middle Eastern country. Oh, my God, I just was, I tell you, I just, uh, I started to, there was something about Egypt to me, and I, it wasn't until my sister told me that, well, you know, the reason why you feel so connected to Egypt is because our great-grandparents um, came from Alexandria. Um, you know, anyway, so that's, I think, those journeys. And then, you know, you have those experiences. And sometimes you think, wow, I'm glad I did. I can write or talk about them, you know, because, you know, my brother, I say to him, so how was it? How, how was Italy? Did you enjoy yourself? He says, if I see one more F in church, I'm going to scream. I said, <laughs> George, what about your trip? Didn't you like, like... I was fine, yeah. We had some nice restaurants. On. See, when you learn about a culture and you go over and you probably know more than the people who are guiding you, I mean, really learn about that culture, it makes a difference. And then you start experiencing the other things. You know, you just don't want to start looking for the... Have the foundation already there and there you can spring off that and go to these places and you can ask questions because you understand more than the average person. So it's discovering. That's the thing about it. It's the unknown and discovering that I enjoy so much about those journeys. And no matter which way or how they came about, they're still serving a purpose. How was the experience of writing that book for you? Well, it took you to something about taking it out of your head and putting it down on paper. Because that then creates an action. Whereas the other just stays in your head, and that's what happens with people. Things just stay in their heads. And then we wonder after they've gone, well, what did that mean? Well, why didn't we ask? So by writing these journeys, at least my family has a history of some part of the family having explored things and how and what they discovered. I know several times that you've talked about um, how... When you go away from acting, you know, and you and you go in your travels around your journeys around the world, uh, that it feeds you and it sort of feeds you creatively, which you can put that into your work. How does? How, could you explain that a little bit for us? How does that work? Even though it, we may not come across a story about something it is we know, um, traveling brings a certain confidence I feel within you, and I think. Because it feeds me when I have finished a journey and I come back home and I have a, an objective of what I've been through, uh, I come back full. And that's what I put into the role I'm playing. 
It's the energy. It's the way you feel about something. It's the fact that you conquered something, overcame something, uh, got emotionally in touch with something. All those are the elements that you eventually interpret. A painter will put that on a canvas. A dancer will express themselves through an idea of action that they will do in dance while an actor takes from life. And to me, what serves me is... Uh, and which then resonates because you want it to resonate because you don't want to just keep it within yourself. You know, it's like listening to Trump. I keep bringing up Trump, the poor man. I keep on bringing him up. He talks about things, but that talks about nothing. There's no substance. It's just either putting people down or talking about things, but there's no gravitas. You can't go in and say, oh, what does he think about this foreign policy? You know, so... That's what happens. You have to fill yourself up. It's not about money and it's not about greed. You fill yourself up with knowledge, behavior, by understanding another culture. All those things are the things that we as actors put on our canvas, and that's what we interpret. Well, you had mentioned earlier about you know being stuck in that really scary uh, hurricane in Mexico. Did you take anything away from that experience in terms of like... Uh, being more prepared when you go away somewhere, was there something you learned from that experience that you would keep in mind the next time you travel or anything like that? Well, I've been in four hurricanes. The most dangerous one was the one in Hawaii. I fell into a hole. I oh. almost drowned. Um, yeah, the ground opened up, and I fell into it straight in, and it was so narrow they had to pull me out, but the winds were as huge humongous, you couldn't even turn a corner. Um, they all vary. I mean, when I was in Cuba twice, hurricane, the war of the sea coming into the land and making things, I mean, you know, when Cuba runs out of things, they run out of things. There's nobody around to help them. So, um, but, no, you know, you you can't plan those things. Uh Things that you do plan, is you, you, you see, does this country have a lot of mosquitoes? What kind of injections you may need? Uh, what are the things that's good to take, like Vaseline I always travel with because uh, that always helps any kind of uh, infection getting worse. You know, I cover it. If I, or sometimes you can get an athlete's foot you know, in your toes, and I put that in there because of the moisture. So I'll put that in there. But things you learn is, you know, you take also food that in case you can't get food, like when the hurricane hit and I ended up with a can of sardines, I had to, um, I would have brought things, food bars and things like that, so I wouldn't worry about, you know, being hungry. Of all the places you have been to, which which would you recommend for a friend to visit? Well, it's also the times, isn't it? Um, yeah. I would have, you know, go to Israel for Christmas. Um, if you're Christian, whatever religion you are, um, it's just very festive. And um, and then spend the next week at Christmas Eve in Petra in Jordan and go through the Sikh to the... to. Um, all those wonderful ruins in um, of the Nabataean society and uh, civilization, and, um, but you can't do that now. So I would say, you know, you have to look at the safer countries because Americans are not popular. Um, you get bad PR when you're uh, powerful. You know, right. look at Russia. You know, look mm-hmm. at Russia. Anyway, um, so I would say Italy. Love Italy if you've not been. And it depends on what you like. There's everything there, you know. Great uh, food, great culture. I mean, in Rome, you just walk around and it's, everything's art. Uh, the clothing, you know, the concerts, the the ruins, the history of Rome. And, you know, I, I remember going, getting a car at 7 o'clock in the morning, picking me up to go to Azizi because I wanted to find where that little church of St. Francis was where he started his religion and uh, and go and so it was a three hour drive so we 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 stopped halfway and they're making fresh bread and and cut prosciutto and espresso coffee and 
and we're going in style. It was absolutely fantastic. And then I, I discovered the church by mistake because it happened to be inside another church, and that's how I discovered it. But oh my God, to go to Azizi and see those, see the ruins and the story of St. Francis, so I find it extraordinary. And then um, there's going to Pompeii and going down to Naples and um, Herculaneum, you know, where the, the volcano hit. And, you know, taking that drive, I mean, that drive down there is just phenomenal. Um, yeah, and then Greece, you know, you don't have to stay in Athens because Athens is not everybody's um, cup of tea. Um, they go to the islands, but the islands, are, I mean, everybody goes to Mykonos and all that because they want to play and have fun. But uh, after a while, you know, it gets too noisy for me. I love Santorini because you have it all. And boy, there's nothing like to go walk down these steps all the way down to the volcano, to the mouth down there. And you sit in the cafe and George brings you a big basket of newly caught seafood and you pick what you want and he grills everything and brings it to your table while the sea is splashing up and you can feel the breeze and the, you can feel some of the mist and, and you're having all this incredible grilled food grilled fish that just come out of the sea and your wine and your bread and your butter and and good conversation and pretty things to look at. Yeah. Well, I love all of your pictures of Santorini. That's already on my wish list of somewhere to go someday. <laughs> it's a oh, beautiful isn't it? picture. There's a place called Thera. That's in the middle of the... It's a horseshoe, you know, in... Ancient times, in the 1500s, it was called Strongili, which means round. And two-thirds of that island went under because of the volcanic eruption. That's why it's the horseshoe, the shape of the horseshoe. So on one side, um, you've got Agritheri, which is where they found covered, that had been covered by the, by the ash. They found part of the ancient city of Santorini and then you go in the middle of it, you go to Thera, and you've got all those houses built on the cliff face there, and straight across from there is the volcano, which is still alive. And uh, and then you go to the whole other end to a place called Ia. And at 10 o'clock, you sit there, and you look at that sunset at 10. It's pink. You have a bottle of wine with you, you just sit out there, and it's just fantastic. <laughs> 